Today we have two presenters. The subject is Fogelpo Cave. They'll tell you all about it if you've never heard of it. Uh, our first presenter is Aaron Addison. He is a geospatial information systems genius at Washington University, graduate of Carbondale. Um, and he, um, besides really understanding GIS, Avocationally, as a cave explorer, scientist, surveyor, and mapper, done international work mapping caves. And he currently is leading at Fogelpo Cave a remapping effort. The cave was originally principally mapped by Catholic Father Paul Whiteman, who's still alive still says mass six times friday and saturday at ava missouri he's 85 years old related to the whiten pharmacy clan in waterloo he as a teen began surveying the first time the mapping of the cave i think he did about seven miles so far 15 miles have been mapped but not with advanced technology aaron is leading an effort to remap it and more importantly what we lack is a layered GIS approach where we will know above ground exactly where the passages are and how deep below ground. So that effort is going to take years. They've been at it for about a year. So Aaron, please step forward and begin your first of two presentations. <laughs> I don't usually have a problem talking a lot because I have to teach class too and whenever I start talking hallway doors start closing and stuff like that. Uh, but if you can't hear me, let me know and I can always talk louder. Um, thanks to, to Carl and Penn for inviting me to present today to talk a little bit about our work that's ongoing, uh, primarily at Fogelpole Cave but also in some of the areas of the nature preserves, um, uh, notably the Paul Whiteman Subterranean Nature Preserve as we continue to understand Fogelpole Cave and, and more broadly the recharge for this entire uh, part of Monroe County. As Carl said, uh, I've been around this area. I really enjoy coming to talk in Monroe County because I lived here for a number of years um, in the 1990s and I grew up in Murfreesboro just down the road. So I've been caving in Monroe County for almost uh, over 25 years now. Um, so, you know, I was, I knew Armin Kruger and we went out there and visited all the time. I'm sure some of you knew Armin. Um, I've met some of you. I see familiar faces. I've been in a number of caves um, north to south and east to west in Monroe County. Um, so, I guess without further ado, let's see if we can uh, see these. Uh, some of the details going to be really hard to, to pick out on this small screen. So, if you have specific questions, um, please do either move up. There's a couple open seats up here on both sides and or uh, You know approach me and we can talk about any specific questions or things you want to see in more detail um, after the talks conclude so let's see here. So um, as Carl said um, Father Paul Whiteman who was just Paul Whiteman when he found the cave uh, This is the, the earliest known record I can find in print, in a publication for Fogelpole Cave. And here, uh, you know, this, this publication was called Caves of Illinois. And I have a copy of it here that I'm not going to pass around because this is a very rare book. This has been out of print since 1966. This map is 55 years old uh, this year. So this is the work, or some of the work that uh, the Father Paul did in mapping and understanding Fogelpole Cave. And it is accompanied by a uh, description of the cave in a rough location by uh, Township and Range. Remember before GPS, we did Township and Range is how we located things. Um, so there are parts of this that are really interesting to read because they're part of the history of the cave. And they talk a little bit about how they explored the cave. They talk about what the entrance of the cave looked like 60 years ago as opposed to today. Uh, you know, before there were row crops around the sinkhole and things like that uh, that might have led to some siltation and so forth. So it's a really important piece of 
evidence in the history of the cave and our understanding of it. One of the, the uh, you know, this was state of the art for the time. And one of the drawbacks of this, though, is um, if you look at this map closely, you'll notice it doesn't have very much detail. There's just kind of these two parallel sets of lines that are meandering underground. And that is representative of the cave, but it's not as helpful whenever we're trying to do uh, research in the cave and locate a pool that might have invertebrates in it or fish or, uh, you know, some geologic phenomenon that we're trying to understand uh, within that environment as well. So moving on from that time period into the 1980s and 1990s when I became involved in the cave, there was still quite a bit going on. There was a lot of mapping going on at that point, but it was all happening in yet a different format. And so the state of the art for that day would have been something like this, which was just a large paper map of the cave that was drawn by hand, probably uh, on mylar with ink. And so uh, you, it was a very time-consuming task. If you had to make changes or revisions, it meant a lot of additional work. And it wasn't something that happened very quickly. Uh, still, during that time, there was significant progress made in the exploration of the cave. Sometime I was trying to find a date on this last night, and I just couldn't come up with it. Either. I think it was in 1990, during a caver meeting in Monroe County, the Lantern Cave was connected to Focopole Cave. Uh, through an exploration trip. We pushed the cave southward, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, through a passage called Mud Alley and, uh, and emerged at Sunfish Cave. Uh, we surveyed another cave that had been known but wasn't really reported called Coon Pit uh, that we found from inside the cave. You know, we're surveying along in the cave, and all of a sudden there's a daylight, you know, so we had to, you have to literally try to climb out there and get your bearings on where you're at then go back through the cave and try to find a way onto the surface and get the appropriate permissions from landowners <laughs> and whatnot. We connected another area of the cave called Twin Pits. This was another thing uh, that had been lost to time. Uh, Father Paul had talked about this passage, but nobody could find it, and, and he never surveyed it. And so it took some amount of effort to uh, systematically go through all the possibilities from inside the cave and then to uh, go back in with the proper survey techniques and document that. Uh, and then we spent a lot of time walking around on farms and in the woods looking for other possible entrances to Fogelpol Cave. If you've ever been around the Renault area, uh, you know, I, I don't think you could go anywhere and not see a sinkhole. And all of those sinkholes, as, a, as you'll see in a minute, are part of this, this thing that we're calling Fogelpol Cave. Uh, so they're all important, but they don't all uh, necessarily mean that a human being can fit through into the cave. Some of the other activities that happened in this time period was, were restoration trips. Uh, this is a trip from the mid-1990s to clean out a sinkhole that had had a bunch of trash dumped in it. It was right next to um, one of the roads in, the, in that area. This is a photography trip. This is Brian Schaffner at this period of time, and this photography trip, uh, well, I, I probably can't go back now. Yeah, I can. Yeah, this uh, photography trip was in support of the brand spanking new 1989 Fogelpole Cave Nature Preserve. And at that time, the, the state said, we want to have a display at the Illinois State Fair. And what we really need are some high quality pictures from inside the cave. So there, uh, Steve Taylor, who will be speaking right after me, is in this photo. I'm in this photo from 1989, and a number of cave photographers and uh, other longtime Illinois cavers are also in this photo. But our, our sole mission at that time was to go in and take as many high-quality photos that we could um, in support of an exhibit that was going to happen at the Illinois State Fair later that year, which in, in fact did happen. Now the trick to this is that in 1989, we didn't have fancy digital cameras. And so when you were taking pictures in the cave, you had no idea what you did or didn't have on film until a week or two weeks later after you had developed your film. And so there was no idea to know if your shot underlit, is it overexposed, and all of those things that we kind of take for granted 
Because now we just hold up our phone or our camera and say, yep, got it, no, didn't have it. And we can, we can correct that in real time. At this point in time, you couldn't do that. And it was a lot more uh, time consuming because you had to take a whole bunch of shots of the same thing and you would hope and cross your fingers that one of those was going to turn out to be uh, a quality shot. Uh, one of the other things that was happening, uh, come on, was that this was the quality of the data being collected. And these are, uh, you know, it was the quality of the day, it was best practices at the time, but looking back now, you know, we would look at this and, and just kind of shudder at that and say, uh, why even bother if you're going to, you know, look like you're, you've had eight cups of coffee if you were, you know, recording all of this data, um, that makes it a lot more difficult to use for different uh, uh, purposes. You know, so the, the purpose isn't just to, to map the cave. That's kind of the beginning of everything else. The management of the watershed, the uh, interpretation of the cave, the, the science that goes on in a variety of domains that range from water to paleontology to biology to geology. Um, all of those kinds of things are supported by this baseline information that we're collecting right now inside the cave. So we talked about the nature preserve. So that then brings us up to 2014. And you might be saying, hey, wait a minute, there was, you know, this period between the end of the 90s and 2014. What happened in those 14 years? And unfortunately, the answer is not very much. And this is a, was a uh, combination of factors that led to this, uh, not the least of which is that key personnel that were really the, the drivers in the exploration had moved out of the area, including myself. Uh, whenever I, uh, I got married in 1998, uh, my wife and I moved to Texas for two years before we moved back. And so we kind of lost some momentum in there. There were some policy changes with the state and the way that they wanted to handle their nature preserve. Uh, at that time, the, the cave was gated around that same time in the late 80s, early 90s. So there were a lot of different things that were, were happening at that particular point that led to that outcome. Uh, but in any event, we came to uh, 2014 and uh, were approached by Clifftop. They had this idea. There was an opportunity to protect a large area of the watershed for Fogelpole Cave, what we would call a recharge area since there are no surface creeks or streams or anything inside there, that means any drop of water falling on the recharge area goes underground, and we're not going to see it again until it comes out of one of the springs. So the spring is just the outlet for all of the underground streams for any given uh, cave area. And so this red line was the, the parcel that was purchased by Clifftop uh, just a few years ago. And already in this aerial photo, as I'm sure many of you recognize, you can see evidence of numerous sinkholes. And this is a characteristic of what we call karst landscape. Karst is typically limestone that's underlaid by caves, fractures, joints, all of those geologic features that lend themselves to cave formation. Doesn't mean that every one of those leads to a cave, but a lot of them do. And you know the ones that do, because there's either the obvious opening or there's that story that's been passed down through the ages the, of a uh, sinkhole that won't hold water, or one that does hold water is probably silted shut and so on. A lot of these have been modified over the years. They've had standpipes put in them or they've been backfilled. Um, I'm, always, I'm always hearing stories about, you know, I, I filled up my sinkhole and now my basement flooded. It's like, well, that's where all the water was going before, and now it's going into your basement. Um, you know, we, I had a lot of conversations up around New Hanover uh, with homeowners along those lines. Uh, but, you know, you can see the changes in this uh, over time. We have a pretty good aerial photo record going back to the, the 1970s for Monroe County, and even some and now that go back to the 30s. This is a very different world in the 1930s. I read a book called The History of Monroe County. Anybody read this book? It's about that thick. <laughs> and it only goes up to like 1960 or something like that. It's crazy. It goes all the way back to the 1500s when the first uh, missionaries came into Monroe County. If, you've got, if you want to know about Monroe County, 
That is the book to read. Uh, part of it is. Yes, that's what they wrote. Yeah. So uh, I was given this book by my grandmother, uh, just kind of randomly, uh, but it turned out to be really an interesting uh, understanding of this part of the world. Uh, one thing that I'll point out on this photo also is this little inholding in here that's about 27 acres is the Fogopol uh, Nature Preserve. That's the nature preserve owned by the state. And so Clifftop property kind of encircles that with the exception of just that little bit of the road. <coughs> So once it became clear that the transaction for Clifftop to purchase the property was going to follow through, uh, we all started turning on what next. And part of that what next was this realization that the cave really needed to be properly documented. And that there were a lot of things going on already, and there were a lot of things in research specifically that people wanted to have go on that were not being well supported by the current documentation in the cave. Um, and this, again, this would range anything from measuring flash floods in the cave to doing biological research or understanding the geology. But it also extends to the surface caves because you can't manage the surface if you don't know where the things are underground in relation to that. As it just so happens, um, I was going back through some of my emails this week as I was getting ready for this talk, and literally, like, within three weeks, but also totally coincidentally, I had sent an email to Steve Taylor saying, hey, Steve, I've got this crazy idea about remapping Fogelpole Cave. And I hadn't been in the cave since 2001. And Steve sent back and said, that's kind of freaky that you just said that, because... And then he started telling me about some of the things that have been going on with Clifftop. Uh, the way that that ultimately concluded was we produced this, pro this uh, uh, document that outlined something called the Fogopol Cave Survey Project. And this was uh, done by myself, by Steve Taylor, and uh, with major editing and advisory assistance from Carl and Penn. But these were kind of going to be the outline of the guidelines of how we would go about documenting the cave for Clifftop. Along that time, also, uh, documents started coming in. This is a, a schematic that Steve provided saying, these are the areas of priority for surveying so that we can support either ongoing research or research that needs to start right away. And so we were able to prioritize our end cave activities based on feedback from scientists and researchers saying these are the areas that are important to us. So this is what our efforts look like today. It's a very different world. What would happen in the up until about 10 years ago was you would go in, you would kind of have some loose leaf sheets of paper, and you would take your notes on them. Those will probably get Xeroxed. Before Xerox, they would have been mimeographed. Uh, but these things just were not archival. They were not even uh, <coughs> curated in any meaningful way. Whoever did that, they took those notes home with them. You were probably never going to see them again. You know, they, they held on to them for five years. They moved away. They went out of cave exploration, and we lost that link to the data. And so we said, we're not going to do that anymore. And we started developing protocols to keep that from happening. And a couple of those things are shown on this slide here. I have some, uh, some of our survey gear here that I'm going to pass around in just a second. But we keep all of our survey notes now in bound waterproof books. And so these, the minute they come out of the cave, get entered into the data reduction program that helps us understand the math of the cave. But they also all get scanned at archival settings. And then they also get put into many different locations. I have a copy. There's a copy. Um, Clifftop actually supports us through a box account, which is cloud computing. And so we keep archival copies there as well in a secure location. But, you know, this idea of losing survey notes should not happen <coughs> anymore. And it's further supported by keeping things in the bound book so that we're not having notes go each different direction. These books are turned into the project coordinator, which is me. Um, at the conclusion of every trip. And so we know where all the data are at any given time, and we can keep track of that over time, which I think is equally important. 
Uh, the way we collect the data in the cave is kind of interesting for a lot of folks. Uh, you know, people are like, do you use GPS in the cave? How do you do that? And unfortunately, GPS doesn't work underground. You have to have a clear line of sight between you and the satellites for GPS to work. And that makes it really handy for your phone or for your car and things like that, but not very handy for, for being underground. And so what we have to use is a 100-foot fiberglass tape and a compass and clinometer. So literally, we will stretch this tape between two spots in the cave, right down that distance in this book, and then we will use an instrument, which is the sighting compass. We would look between those two points and get a bearing on that. And then we have another dial on this instrument called a clinometer. And the clinometer, you read this way, and you read up and down to get your slope. And so the, those three measurements combined give us the line plot that represents the, the direction of travel in the cave. Um, and we have multiple sets of these in each bag because we do redundant readings to eliminate mistakes uh, to the maximum extent possible anytime we're in the cave. Um, so there are some other things in our, in our kit here. I'm not, I'm not going to pass around the fiberglass tape. I think everybody knows what a fiberglass tape is. But what I will pass around is uh, some of the other things that we have. We write our station names just on uh, weatherproof flagging. We sometimes use something called a disto. And what a disto will do is instead of stretching the fiberglass tape, this one's probably not going to work for me. We take the batteries out of them because they, uh, they corrode, obviously. But what the disto would do for you is you, instead of stretching the tape, you can just shoot the laser to the next station and read the reading right off of, of here. Or if the ceiling's really tall, there's no way to stretch the tape, I can just stand there and measure, and then I can look and see what that particular reading would be and record it in the field book. So I have a couple sets of these that I'll pass around, and you guys can take a look at these and get a feel for it. Um, although all of this gear is, has been cleaned up, um, you'll also notice that these smell like a cave. You know, because they spend a lot of time in caves, so uh, you know, feel free to to look around in there and then, then give somebody else the chance. So, in 2000, there was a program sponsored by the state of Illinois to provide dollars for research and understanding of various things in, in and around Illinois related to conservation. And I, as I recall, it was actually called Conservation 2000 or something like that. Somebody might, might remember the exact name of that. One of the major things that came out of that program for this, uh, for Monroe County really, was the delineation of a lot of the large springs in the county. And there are a lot of big caves in Monroe County, um, and they're not well understood, or at least up until that point, they were not well understood. Really the only way to do that, to, to delineate recharge areas, is through an activity called dye tracing where you dump fluorescein or rhodamine dye in a sinkhole or in a culvert or something, and then you put uh, what are called charcoal packets, and the charcoal packet looks like uh, you took a chunk of uh, barbecue charcoal, smashed it up with a hammer, and then built a little envelope out of a screen door, and then you put that in the, in the spring or wherever you want, in the cave or somewhere that you want to detect that. And then through a lab process, they can tell whether or not any of that dye is adhering to the the chunks of smashed up charcoal in that packet, but the packet still lets the water run through. So these have to be checked regularly though because, uh, you know, sometimes we get big rain events and things like that. You have to know travel times and so on. Anyway, the outcome of that was this map. And this map in yellow highlights the recharge area for Fogelpole Cave <coughs> as best we know it today. Uh, and what that means is the, the, the red area, I've left the Paul Whiteman Nature Preserve on the map, that is what Clifftop is protecting out of the Fogelpole Cave entirety recharge right now. Now that's just Clifftop. There are lots of other landowners that are protecting parts of this recharge as well. Some of you are in this room, and that's fantastic. 
Uh, but it sure gives you a, a, an idea of how big an area for just one cave can be. Now you see some other gray shapes around this, and these are other big springs that are in the area that we uh, are still trying to understand. The water that's over here is somehow going down here, but we've never seen any evidence of that water in Fogel Pole Cave. And so one of the possibilities there is that there's another big cave over here in this kind of sketched out area of dashed line that could be funneling towards uh, areas like Collier Spring, if you're familiar with that. This shape up here to the top is the recharge area for Illinois Caverns. The small area in here is for a, another cave system called Kruger Dry Run. Armin and his brother <coughs> owned an entrance to that cave. And then this area over here to the east is for a spring, I believe it's called Lance Spring. Lance Spring, maybe? Uh, I have to check my notes on that. You'll also see that there's a dotted line through the Fogel Pole Recharge. And the reason for that dotted line is that around that same time, actually, or in the 1990s, the Environmental Protection Agency um, and Water Resources offices in Illinois classified all groundwater, all water running to a nature preserve as having special protection. I think they called it class three groundwater. What that means is that they can uh, enforce conservation practices. They can't keep anybody from doing something on their land, but there are certain guidelines you have to follow um, in those situations. And this part that's to the south is not water that's flowing to the nature preserve. The water's already gone through the nature preserve by the time it gets down here, so there's a different set of rules for that part of the, the recharge area. So let's zoom in on this a little bit and maybe take a, a little bit closer look just at Fogel Pole. Um, one of the other things that I'll point out as we zoom in is this little area here, which is right behind the church on Kaskaskia Road as you travel south. One of the really interesting things you find out sometimes in dye tracing is things aren't as simple as you might like them to be. And what happened in this area is that we put dye into this sinkhole, and part of that dye came out in Illinois Caverns, and part of that dye came out in Fogel Pole Cave. <laughs> and there's nobody that knows why that happened, or how that happened, because that sinkhole is not an open sinkhole that could be easily entered by somebody to map it and survey and stuff like that. So you get, you know, there's, there's these little intriguing things out there like that that we're still trying to, to understand. But here again, you can see that the sinkholes are not just limited to the nature preserve, but they're very dense all throughout this geography. This is what we know of the extent of Fogel Pole Cave. This is the old line plot for the cave and represents the 15 miles of map passages that Carl referenced in his inter introductory remarks. Um, unfortunately, this is also the amount of the cave that isn't really well uh, preserved. It isn't really well documented in terms of the level of detail and process. And so we've set about uh, remapping that and we understand that that's a big effort and that we have to prioritize our efforts uh, but where we're at after our first year or so, uh, well, before I do that, I'll come to that in my next slide. These green lines represent all those dye traces that I was talking about. So water that was put into a sinkhole up here came out down here at Collier Spring. You know, uh, there's that, there's the dye trace that I said went two different directions. You know, the dye went in here, part of it showed up in Illinois Caverns, part of it showed up at the northwest entrance of Fogel Pole Cave. Uh, so you can't go any further in Fogel Pole Cave that way, though. You know, the water's just coming out of a crack in the wall kind of thing. Uh, but lots of uh, evidence of water flowing through the cave. And we can't make any assumptions other than these straight lines. So it makes the drawing and the map look kind of chaotic. But just, you know, all you can say is I put something in the ground here, and I didn't see it again until it came out down there. So that's a hydrologic connection. The water does flow between those two things. The organization or the company, the consultant that did that work is the Ozark Underground Lab. They're world renowned for their work in, uh, in doing this kind of dye tracing. And in fact, they hold the world record for the longest dye trace ever conducted. 
They put water into a sinkhole north of Big Springs in the Ozarks in Missouri, and it came out 55 miles later at Big Spring. You know, and so that gives you an idea how big the recharge area is for something like Big Spring. Um, each one of those dye traces has an entire informational sheet on what happened. And that was all published in a report. And you can go and look, and it'll tell you in a high level of detail what they put into the ground, when it came back out, how much of it came back out, and all of the other types of uh, information you would want to know. This is really important information as you go out and try to understand uh, where there might be more cave passages within the system. So here's the slide I was getting to. The blue represents what we have now remapped to that higher level of standards so far. And so you can see that we're just now getting underneath the large part of the nature preserve. We've mapped a lot of passages under the nature preserve. But again, in that priority uh, schema, we are documenting all of that before we head off into these other areas of the cave. There are lots and lots of entrances to Fogelpole Cave, uh, as characterized by any cave system that's in a sinkhole plane. What I'd like to do on this one, though, I think is uh, zoom in a little bit more so you can see some of that detail. And so if you're trying to get your bearings here, this is the, the big white pole barn that's on the clifftop property right here. The, the house, I, I guess the former house is right here. Um, and then the state-owned nature preserve sits right here in the middle, and the gated entrance is in this little blue kind of U-shaped part of the, the passage. And so you can see that these things roughly do align, but they aren't the same. And that's really important if you're going to shoot a line out five miles and you're even off by a little bit. A little bit here turns into hundreds and hundreds of feet by the time you get five miles out. Because those lines are, are not coming together, they're, they're diverging. There's some other things that are really interesting going on here. Um, two areas that I found really interesting is this area right here, because it looks a lot more complex than the old map did. So maybe they didn't go in every passage that was available back then. And one of the things that we've talked about is that there's probably more to Fogelpole Cave than it was ever known. And it may be miles more, we just don't know yet. Um, another area that, that's similar to that is up here. <coughs> Um, I know it's tough to, to see, but the white part ends right here, and the blue part continues on for hundreds of more feet. And so those are things that we found out in the last month of doing survey. You have to systematically go through each one of these in order to find things like that. Neither one of these passages end yet, so they, they keep going. And that means that those are most likely new passages that have never been seen before uh, that we're now documenting as a part of Fogelpole Cave. So just to, to summarize, as we begin to, to wind, uh, wrap up, we've set over 260 survey stations in the cave so far in the last year. Um, generally speaking, each team sets between 30 and 50 stations in one trip. You know, so that's a 12-hour, 10-hour, 12-hour trip into the cave. Uh, so that's a, you know, there, you can kind of break that out. And we've had, you know, well over uh, 15 trips in the cave. Currently, our survey stands at about 12,690 feet, or roughly 2.4 miles. Between the highest point that we've surveyed in the cave and the lowest point, there's a, a maximum differential of 88 feet. So we would say the cave is 88 and a half feet deep right now. We know that the cave is over 100 feet deep from the highest ends all the way to the spring. So we're closing that distance rapidly. Uh, the original survey. Uh, the paper map that I showed you doesn't have profiles or cross-sections. Uh, and so we're, we're collecting that data in addition to the plan view data as we go through. Uh, and, you know, any chance I get, I, I hand out thank yous, especially because all of the surveyors that go into the cave are volunteers and do this on their own time. <laughs> We've had a couple of Clifftop members that have shown interest in learning cave survey. And so if you think that's something that you, you want to go crawl around or swim in 54 degree water, you know, you're welcome to join us and, and we'll have a good time. Um, so what I thought I'd do to wrap up is just show you some photos from that, these experiences. This is one of our first, and it may have been the first survey trip that we did into the cave last year, last winter. 
Um, it was quite cold. You can see the house is still there in the background. Uh, but Cliff Top was kind enough to let us camp there in the yard of the house, which really helps for people that have to drive longer distances. You know, I, I mentioned I used to live in Monroe County. I now live uh, with my family in St. Charles. So it's about, you know, a 50-mile hour drive for me, something like that. Um, some of these folks came from much, much further away. So it really is important. It's critical to have that central location or, or even kind of quasi field house experience so that people can can come to that one place uh, and prepare for these trips as they get longer and longer. Um, these are going to be probably a little hard to see with the with the lights. I'd be happy to show you uh, in more detail if you want to see them. But this is what the cave looks like inside. So it's got a mud or clay floor. There's some big rocks, what we would call breakdown, on the uh, on the floor that is covered up. This passage, <clears throat> the mud's real tacky, so it, you know it makes that that mud uh, sound on the bottom of your boots when you walk through. And the reason for that is that this passage floods occasionally. So whenever you get the big rain, there are parts of the cave that serve as kind of a shock absorber, and so the water can move into these areas as the flood peak comes through and then it comes back down in. So this would not have water in it all the time and probably maybe once every 10 to 15 years do we get a rain of the size locally that would flood this passage. And even then it doesn't flood that deep. Not all the cave is walking. A lot of it looks like this, uh, where this has all been clay filled from the <coughs> uh, previous geologic uh, eras. And so it's still being kind of eroded out. So here is a crawlway that, that goes through, and we, we survey all of this as well. You can see it's kind of odd. You get these almost perfectly flat ceilings, and then all the variation is in the floor and the walls. Here's yet another passage. You can see more breakdown, more rocks on the floor in this passage. And you can start to see these ceiling, what we call ceiling channels, where, you know, eons ago the water carved through that part when it was only this high in that passage. And so over, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of years, you get all this other development. Again, everything's coated in clay. Uh, let's see. Here's a, a downstream photo. This is downstream of the Fogelpole entrance. And the cave gets rather large in this area. Here I'm up on a, on a high bank <clears throat> where a passage takes off. And one of our surveyors, Rick Haley, is down in the mainstream of the cave. So you can see that this really does look like um, a surface creek that we would imagine is just running underground. It's the same, you know, these are big things on drainages from uh, caves the size of focal pole. The water here would get deep in a big flood. It would probably be um, as much as even 10 feet deep and just really running through there. Yeah. What are the two? Uh, these are rocks that I'm standing about 30 feet up on <laughs> above the, the water to try to get that perspective. Yeah. I was going to cut them out, but I was afraid of cutting off too much. Again, though, that flat ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of very, very interesting, very characteristic of the cave. Um, unfortunately, focal hole sees. Uh, yeah, anybody know these initials? <laughs> we'll have to admit it. Uh, so Ralph, Ralph and Debbie were there on 2881. <laughs> so 1981 is a while back now. Um, Red was there too around that same time. Uh, but you know, this is this is quite a ways in the cave. Uh, you know, even at that time, which would have been before the the entrance was gated. So. The cave has seen local visitation over the years. It continues to see local visitation in different sections, uh, which is something that we continue to monitor. Um, what's really kind of frustrating about this is that I think this is probably not the first time that this area has been uh, inundated with graffiti. Because if you look at this photo, one of the things that's wrong with it is there's a big white area right here, and all the rest of the walls are brown. What that tells me is probably sometime in the 70s, or maybe even as recently as a month before this this happened, um, somebody had gone in there and cleaned that all off before, you know, and now it's been re-added. 
So we'll probably have some conservation trips to clean things like this up again, too. So that's an accessible paint? In other words, it's someplace that people can get to use it? Not that way. Not anymore, but at the time. Uh, I mean, in other words, it's sitting like right on our road. No. <laughs> now, this is an easily 30 minutes travel time into the cave. Another shot of the mainstream of the cave. You can see the geologic layers, the rock bedding, as it's cutting down through those. The passages as you go downstream can get very canyon-like meaning they just get really tall. They're not very wide, but they continue to get taller and taller as the cave stream uh, down cuts through the bedrock. Uh, sometimes the water is unavoidable. Uh, I like this picture because it shows that, but also shows there's our survey tape kind of stretching across the top between those two points. Uh, so they're documenting both through photography, monitoring, and then also the survey that's happening concurrently. Here's another one, it's a little bit better lit, uh, so you can see the different layers. There's these black coatings on some of the rocks. I'm sure uh, this stuff can get really slick, this mag manganese oxide coating. Um, and there's been papers written about that research done uh, on other caves here in Monroe County as well. Still with the flat ceiling, ultimately, and kind of this hourglass shape in this passage. Here, Michael Bradford's reading an instrument that I, I handed around. He's using a LED light to, to illuminate that. So he's reading from his station back to wherever the other person is holding the other end of the tape to get that compass heading and that clinometer read. And he's doing it while he's kneeling down in the water. <coughs> Another, uh, this picture I like because this is, uh, if you've ever been in Illinois caverns, it looks a lot like this. You see these big passages. Um, and you also see these gravel bars occasionally back and forth. So those same characteristics exist in Fogelpaul Cave as well. Here's a smaller side passage that they surveyed just uh, last weekend. So this picture is a week old. Uh, and this is a very different kind of passage. As you leave the mainstream, the cave's going to get smaller. We still have the vertical canyon. But what's interesting about this is they went into this passage. Notice what happens to the floor. So we have a floor now, now we don't. You know, so it's cut down and the water's somewhere down underneath there that we can't see anymore. You know, and so you have to navigate these and explore these, document them. You can still see the geologic bedding in the walls here uh, as they travel through. Is that like a side passage or is that mm -hmm. the main? It would be a side passage. Just a couple more here. Uh, this is in an upstream area in the cave, headed in the passage that goes to the northwest entrance. Entrance. So this is this is a part of the cave that's actually under the nature preserve. Uh, so it's still a pretty good sized passage. This passage terminates up here. You can see the floors coming up rapidly. And what will happen a lot of times is this will correspond with the sinkhole on the surface where the rock had fallen or collapsed down uh, and sealed off that particular passage. What we do know, uh, hydrologically and geologically, is passages that are this big, they don't just end all of a sudden. You know, so this, this used to go on. And so at some point in geologic time, that collapse occurred. So uh, we couldn't have any of these photos. So the photos take a lot of time and a lot of kind of uh, patience to pull off because you're working in total darkness. And even when you have a digital camera, where you can see instant results. You still have to compose things in the dark. You're constantly fighting with things like autofocus and lighting and stuff. So I just, again, want to give thanks to Brian Schaffner, Bob Osborne, Michael Bradford, Chad McCain, Steve Taylor, who you'll hear from next, and some of the photos are mine as well. But these guys certainly do the lion's share of that. The photos I take, I always say, I'm just taking them as I, you know, I'm the point and shoot guy. If I can get a photo while I'm doing survey or something, I'll take it. But I almost never go on just pure photo trips. So thank you uh, for your attention. And I don't know where we're at on time, but uh, this is, again, one of the photos that was taken in the 1990 for the State Fair. So this picture, we didn't know what this picture would look like until you know probably 10 days after we took it. 
Uh, and this was taken with flash bulbs instead of things like digital flashes and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Anybody have a question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, two things. Number one, I noticed when you're, when you're talking about your location, your map, the map's always interesting. But you never make a reference to where the road is. So they give us a picture of where it's Yeah, where sure. At. Uh, the, uh, the other thing... Go back about 20 slides. <laughs> <laughs> the other question I have is, are, are any of these published or will they be published? So, so for instance, if we could buy maps or, or photographs or what have you. Sure. Um, let, me, let me find, get back here again, maybe to this one. Yeah, that was uh, good one. So, to take take your questions out of order here a little bit, yes, things do get published. Um, from my point of view, all of the data belongs to Clifftop, so it's at Clifftop's discretion on what they do with that data. Well, I'm just thinking like a meeting here if we had right. a, a forward that had photographs or right. maps there. And so I think that is, that's a great suggestion and something that we could easily do. I'm happy to take the paper map that I have. It's our field map. So it might be a little rough, it's not a pretty glossy map, but you're certainly welcome to look at it and understand uh, a little bit more about the cave. Um, I was hoping to have a bigger screen to present this on, which makes it easier to point out roads and things, but um, so this white line coming down this way would be G Road, that's running north and south, and so that makes we get my, I'm sorry, yeah, that's right. That makes this the intersection of M and Kaskaskia Road, right here at this little curve in Kaskaskia Road. This is, yeah, so this is where uh, the county was talking about trying to figure out a way to straighten out this curve. Right. Okay. It's right here. You have G Road and then you have Reed Road. So Reed Road is going to be farther to the east. Farther off that map. Um, well, I don't know if it's off the map. I need to get my bearings too. Okay. I think I'm reasonably sure that this is Reed Road right here. Okay. Because Arden's there's a Kruger that lives in this house. If I have my bearings correct. And so this would be the road going back north to Burksville. Cascade, And then Renault would be just off the bottom of this map. With Illinois Caverns up here. Any other? In, uh, in terms of publishing infor information, um, Steve and Carl and I and Aaron have hopes that eventually we can find funding for a really take you into the cave kind of an application. Um, it would involve supercomputing, a lot more photography, errands, mapping. Um, it's a matter of finding funding for this particular project. We're looking. We're all looking. <laughs> But it is, it is a very expensive endeavor um, that we hope to be able to do eventually. If we are able to do it, we're going to have to rent a theater to show that because it's going to be such a fascinating exploration. In the meantime, we're probably going to, within the next year, set up a special page on Clifftop's website where people will be able to look at photographs, <coughs> um, read some of the reports and analyses that we're doing. Um, we haven't done that yet, um, simply because the work is ongoing and um, we have to have some time to get this special web page <laughs> set up. Um, so that will be forthcoming. Um, I don't know in terms of selling the photographs, um, it's a possibility, but we tend to regard knowledge and the beauty of our natural area as something that should be available, certainly to the citizens of Monroe County, 
at no cost whatsoever. Um, so while it might be a nice fundraising idea, I just don't know if that's something that we would do. It would be something that perhaps our board would want to discuss. Um, does that kind of help well, in, in terms yeah, of it, it, getting further information? The, the, the two things I'm talking about, road locations, maps don't mean much unless you can have a reference point. Right. And if you have a true. surface reference, then you look at something and you say, well, I know what that is. Yeah. If that's you true. Mean something. Uh, Could you come teach my class? Because I have a whole class of graduate students who can't get that concept. Yeah, <laughs> a, lot, a, lot a, lot of people know the maps. a lot of people no longer do maps, the paper kind. Um, we also tend to be very careful in terms of offering maps of the, the cave system in association with roadway features, because one of the things that has kept the graffiti in the cave, in Fogelpole, to an absolute minimum, has been the long-term protection and limitation of visitation by partying people who write graffiti on cave walls. Um, so that's something we want to continue to avoid. Now, Aaron did mention that Clifftop volunteers have helped with the surveys, and we would absolutely encourage people to volunteer, learn properly how to work within a cave system, and really be able to appreciate the wonder down under. Um, but do it in a proper fashion. So if anybody does want to volunteer, please contact us, and we'll put in touch with Aaron. And, and that, to build on what Penn's saying, is that doesn't have to be surveying and laying in the water. It can be, <laughs> it, it can be uh, a monitoring trip or a graffiti removal trip or uh, some other conservation trip uh, or a photography trip. There are lots of opportunities to contribute that don't necessarily, you know, it's not, um, you know, this or nothing kind of approach. It, it, there's a little bit of something different for uh, several different types of tastes. Um, is there a lot of graffiti in the cave? Or have, no. you, have you seen anything of ancient paintings or anything? Or any kind of fossilized stuff or something that would indicate that maybe ancient people were there? We found a license plate from 1955. <laughs> <laughs> also, the, yeah. thing that, the thing that got me was the vastness of the openings, the different openings in the cave. And is that caused from millions of years of water going through or something? So I, I, I can't speak to the exact time frame, but yes, uh, everything that's happening in the cave is happening because of water. Um, you know. It, one of the, the common myths is that things fall in caves like during an earthquake. Like surely there would have been collapse in the cave during the uh, 1804 earthquake on the New Madras. And there probably wasn't. One of the things that we know to be true is you can't feel earthquakes when you're in a cave. Mm -hmm. You can only feel earthquakes if you're within about five feet of the surface of the earth. Um, and other than that, you're moving as, as a unit with the earth, and you don't really have that sensation of the, the sway or the back and forth. And so things that fall in caves, generally speaking, happened a long time ago. Um, now, the exception to that would be around entrances where you would have frost heave and things like that. They're still, you know, constantly acting on the rocks. To your earlier question, um, the things that are found in the cave that tend to be older, and Steve may, may talk to this, but they're, uh, you know, related to paleontology. So, you know, you might find, um, you know, sloth bones, you might find, they're not in this cave, but in caves very near here across the river in Missouri, there are saber-toothed tiger tracks in the cave, and things of that nature. Uh, but I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence in this cave the Native Americans used to pay. Well, we, we own property out on, uh, he did, um, on John Creek Bridge Lane, and when you walk across the creek here, you can find mm -hmm. all kinds of things, sure. you know, where the rocks are falling, and there was a big sinkhole on that property, but uh, we don't know if it's the cave <coughs> or a water line, when we had a well dug, they said it hit rocks, 
and went through rock. Now they were assuming that there's a cave there. It, it could very well be. That happens quite a lot in Monroe County. Um, and, and to be clear, there are lots of caves in Monroe County that show evidence of usage by uh, Native Americans. You know, the, the ones especially on the river bluffs, um, you know, the well, most well known of which is probably the Fold Salt Peter Cave. Uh, but there are lots of caves that even have pictographs uh, in them that are with, you know, up and down the river. The Indians really use them. In our last year, a uh, paleontologist from the Illinois State Museum made a presentation here about the paleontology of this cave and others. And others. But muskox, sloth, and ancient creatures have been found in Fogelpold. Most of those artifacts are stored at the Illinois State Museum. We videotaped that presentation <coughs> last year. If any of you look on our website and go to the YouTube link down, that entire presentation is online. Thanks to Gina. And this one will be too. This one will be too. That's what she's doing. Uh, and Steve, you aren't covering any camera problems. Okay, well, there's no saber tooths here, but there are saber tooths in other cases yeah. in Monroe, but not this one yet. I am out of time. Okay, Steve's up next. Thank you. Steve Taylor is a cave biologist at the Natural History Survey at the University of Illinois, Urbana. And you heard a bit from Aaron, one of his ancient caving bubbas, that uh, he's also very much in amateur space. Can I have your attention, please? Okay. So, I didn't take her personally. Um, Steve also is Clifftop's lead science advisor for all things going on at the Whiteman Nature Preserve and Fogelpole Nature Preserve. And that's really a daunting task. Aaron alluded to, I'll take a minute so you can have a seat for just a second. <laughs> There's a dozens of projects going on. The State Water Survey has done water quality studies. We wanted to baseline what the quality of that cave was and what the surface was, which was 400 acres of soybeans for 15 years, and then plant it in prairie, which we've done, and document over a decade what changes occur inside the cave, principally, with water, with creatures, and, what doc and document what occurs on the surface with creatures, critters. You know, that's why we're in clifftop. We like critters, okay? Nature stuff. So that's involving a lot of projects. One is water quality. We have paleontology work going on in there. I alluded to that. We've got geology work, including New Madrid fault, seismic activity. There's insect stuff. There's all kinds of stuff going on on the surface and underground. And he orchestrates the whole thing. We're learning as we're going, your question, sir. How do we archive this data, make it understandable to the public? What can we tell the public that we aren't shooting ourselves on the foot with, like, here's every entrance slug, go enjoy the cave. So we, we're, we're learning. This is all new to us. We never did this before. So he's the professional. We are the amateurs. And we're beholden to it for that. So, but his principal expertise is biology, cave biology, He's going to tell you over the next hour loudly. I hope if you can't hear him, he's, you know, he's, he's soft spoken. Uh, of what exists biologically in the cave. Take it away, Steve. All right. So I'm going to start out with my acknowledgments because I can, although I can't talk loudly, I can talk forever. <laughs> And I'm summarizing a bunch of information that a whole bunch of people have contributed to, all sorts of people. Of course, the people of Clifftop, other landowners, um, agency people, universities, 
volunteers, people mapping the caves. Um, so I just can't, I, there's like 200 people I could name. I can't name them all. So thanks to all of that, I'm able to sort of summarize that today. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, what karst is a little, some different aspects of cave invertebrates and cave animals. And then we'll get to a spot where you can run away, or you, you can actually run away any time if you get bored with this. But if you want me to go on and hold forth even further, then I have some other little, more sort of little research vignette topics that I could talk about. And that's another reason to do the acknowledgments in the beginning. Um, karst is, um, Aaron touched on this as well, but this limestone can be dissolved by slightly acidic water and in our area that forms a terrain of sinkholes, springs, and caves. Um, this is actually somewhere in Europe, but it shows how porous the rock can be. And that those interconnections can be really complicated. And for example, you can have a spring in Monroe County, there's a spring on one side of the creek. There's passage that goes underneath that surface creek and comes out on the other side. So you can't just look at the landscape without any dye tracing or anything and know what's going on. That's part of the importance of the mapping that Aaron's group is doing. And it's also intimately connected with the land above. The activities above ground, where we site our houses, septic tanks, whether or not we perceive sinkholes as trash dumps, those all make a difference. Um, there's karst all over the U.S. These different colors are different kinds of karst. And actually, surprisingly, Illinois is about one-fourth karst. Um, it's not all expressed clearly at the surface, but that's sort of surprising. Um, this is a rough approximation of distribution of caves in the United States. And we kind of nestle up on the edge of the Ozarks of Missouri and Arkansas and all the wonderful caves there. Um, also, the caves in this area are influenced by our glacial history and the Pleistocene, and that is part of the reason that most of our caves are located in these karst areas along the edge of the state. And we're down here, of course. Um, the blue is sort of a map of where you find sinkholes in this area. And the orangish color is various little towns. And of course, St. Louis is right up here. And as the roads get bigger and faster, it's more and more feasible to have a little farm bed out in the country and commute into St. Louis to work. Um, and that affects life in the caves. Zooming in on Paul Whiteman Subterranean Nature Preserve, Aaron showed a map earlier, basically the same thing. You can see all these shallow depressions. All of this makes up about 11% of the drainage basin of Fogelpole Cave, and it sits right on top of it. This little piece in here is owned separately by uh, the state, and that's uh, Fogelpole Cave Nature Preserve. Here's a look at one of Clifftop's sinkholes. That opening doesn't really go anywhere. It's out in the middle of what was cornfield and is now a uh, prairie waiting for spring. <clears throat> but it's kind of, I see it as like a, a mouth or a nostril or something. It's like it's connected to the cave and stuff is going in and out. In, in, the, in the winter, there's a little bit of steam that rises up there. When it rains, the water goes in. Um, a couple of sinkholes back, there's um, some ponds and the frogs will go from there and crawl down in that hole in the winter. In the winter. <coughs> and uh, we have to go in through this gated entrance here on the Fogelpole Cave. That's the easy entrance that we go in. And of course you need a kayak paddle when going in the cave in the winter. <laughs> that's a, this is a water sampling research trip. He's got a, a probe there. This guy's a, um, one of Illinois' leading water experts. And Bob Weck of Clifftop and sitting in the back room is here with a couple of graduate students from, uh, one of them's from Western Illinois University and the other's University of Illinois. And they're learning about research under crawly conditions, I guess you could say. And eventually we get into this, the big passage. That, to me, it, it's, a, it's a wilderness. It's a, it's a carefully protected place that hasn't had all the spray paint and bottle rockets and other things that drunk high schoolers like to do. Um, we all were there once. And some of it, some of us may even have regrets. 
But um, you can see the stream is meandering along, and there's these rocky shorelines that I call a riparian zone, and there's animals that like this little side areas. <laughs> and there's places where the water is deep. I was taking this kayak to get across to sample a different passage. We were sampling water in two different spots, but that's why the paddle. Um, caves have different zones from an uh, animal's perspective. The entrance zone still has sunlight, some plants. The temperature is highly variable with the seasons. Um, you have a lot of animals that are normally surface animals will seek shelter there. The twilight zone, basically <laughs> just a few little mosses can grow, um, not, not much plant life can make it. The temperature starts to be buffered from the annual fluctuations and it starts getting more predictable. Um, in the winter it feels real nice to go in there because it's warm. In the summer it feels nice to go in there because it's cool. And then when you get into the dark zone, there's absolutely no sunlight at all, no photons. There's, um, uh, the temperature gets really stable. Um, there's some exceptions, but sort of in general, that's what happens. And the humidity is high. And this has all sorts of implications for the animals that live there. Um, and if you measure <coughs> temperature and light and relative humidity, you can see these zones. Don't look at the specific numbers. This is from lava tube in California, but the same pattern is here. So in the dark zone here, the average yearly temperature is around 56 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's what it is in Vogelpool Cave, all else being equal. I say all else being equal because if you have a big flood, say there's a, the snow is suddenly melting, um, like might be happening now, and you go into the cave, that's the equivalent of having a torrential downpour and all this ice water is going in the cave. Well, the stream is going to get really, really cold. Um, so you get these fluctuations as the climate changes a little bit. So typical of caves is high humidity, stable temperature, no light, and very low energy. There's no sunlight, so there's no photosynthesis. There's no primary producers. That would be plants. And so it's basically it's a decomposer ecosystem. The animals live on organic debris that washes in. And they also, they can't see is a big thing. That means um, you have to have special adaptations like long sensory appendages with CD to feel things. You may be more sensitive to vibrations <coughs> than uh, your surface relatives. Um, and there's no selective pressure to maintain bright colors or camouflage pigmentation and that costs energy and because there's no photosynthesis and there's not much energy in the caves and the animals tend to have lower <coughs> metabolic rates, they live longer, they invest more in fewer bigger eggs. All of these things make for animals that are cave adapted called troglobites. And this is a flatworm which is cave adapted and lives down in Vogelpol Cave. Um, some of the threats to cave life, they're basically the things that people do. When we see sinkholes such as this one that I just showed to Carl the other day, I believe, um, that have stuff dumped in them, that stuff sits there. If, you, if a farmer just tosses his old pesticide cans into a sinkhole and there's a little bit left in there, eventually that can rots out and that stuff gets injected down into the cave. Um, quarrying, uh, septic tanks that leak. So part of what we're doing by studying this cave and Clifftop being involved is, is an opportunity for Clifftop members who live maybe even outside of the focal pole cave drainage basin to understand how land use impacts affect these hidden streams. They're streams just as Aaron said, they're streams like normal surface streams you see, but instead of being on top of the ground, they're down 100 feet underground. And when they're out of sight, it's hard to think about them. You probably wouldn't just change the oil of your car in the stream in front of your house. But if you change it and dump the oil into a sinkhole, it's kind of like that. And so it's kind of getting people to be more aware of that is, is important. Another one of the impacts potentially is climate change. Um, these areas where caves form are in blocks of limestone that aren't continuous across the landscape. They're particular areas of the state. So if Illinois, as in this particular projection, gets to be hot and dry like central Texas far into the future. Um, the animals that live in the caves here can't just 
move and follow uh, the temperature and humidity that matches what they're uh, used to now, they're trapped in their limestone blocks. So climate change could be serious for some of the animals as they impact. Not a bad. <laughs> um, a really common thing here is having uh, uh, egg fields that have erosional rills or um, this little thick chute is going into a sinkhole that's about a three foot deep trench and all of that topsoil and sediment has been washed and injected down into the cave. Here it is popping out of a, a high hole in the cave and down into the cave stream, this is in flood. That water is really turbid because it's transporting what used to be farm fields off towards the spring, eventually out into the Mississippi River to head out to the Gulf of Mexico. And with it, it's carrying other things like contaminants, um, but also it brings nutrients. When the, so there's good things about the water coming in because the animals need food. Sometimes during these floods or after them, you'll see big piles of foamy stuff if people have a lot of detergents and stuff going into their septic and then it washes out into the caves and you get detergents in the cave. Then you have bits of styrofoam, these little white specks are little balls of styrofoam just like you probably seen on surface streams, bits of styrofoam cups and Walmart bags and stuff. They all get in there, pollutants that we would rather not have in the cave environment. I've got to figure out how to make this thing go. This is the, the resurgent spring of Fogelpool Cave. It's kind of a, it's a big rise pool and it just kind of seeps out and then it's flowing out as this, the stream just continuing on the surface. Inside of the cave you can go only so far downstream before the, basically the water meets the ceiling and you have to stop. And then there's this part that's below the water table and it finally comes up on this surface creek. And all of the impacts in that big drainage basin that Aaron was showing earlier, <coughs> they all eventually funnel out to where he's standing there. And here's some of the good. This little organic debris gets washed in at every flood. That's the energy that feeds the animals that live in the cave. And that ends up getting broken down by fungi. These are some fungal hyphae coming off of a leaf and reaching out and discovering some other little bits of wood. And there's animals that love this. It's a great place to forage if you're a little tiny bug that feeds on fungus or bacteria. <coughs> and that starts to get exciting to biologists. This person here is um, in the pose of a cave biologist. We spend most of our time <laughs> in caves on our hands and knees looking at the floor sometimes on our bellies. Um, and it's just some different ways we collect. And sometimes you have to rappel down a rope. There's a little station there. We have a, had a transect station there. This little device is an aspirator. It's used to suck up bugs. You have a little tube that goes to a little container and another tube that goes to your mouth. And if you're smart, you have a little screen on there. So you <laughs> what I actually use is a tube that has uh, a, another filter by my mouth, and that filter is a lawnmower fuel filter that I just hook onto a tube, and that's got this big paper filter wrapped up in it, and that keeps me from getting a bunch of spores in my lungs because I do this all the time. Some of our sampling is quantitative, like using a quadrat, and you can get how many bugs per meter squared or foot squared, or this is a little pitfall trap, a little tiny tube and we stick it out and it's a certain diameter and we leave it there for two days and then you have spring tails or flies per trap day as a unit of measure and you can look at different places and see oh there's high densities of this kind of fly down by the stream but none of them up here and the bait is Lindberger cheese. <laughs> we also collect leaf litter samples and we put them in these funnels with a light bulb and the heat drives the little bugs out and they fall down to the bottom where there's a, a bag of alcohol, and then they go to the lab. And this is my motel room, and they always, it's like I've spent so many nights in these blazing lights. Um, and then a lot of our sampling is just sort of qualitative, generalized sampling, flipping over stones with little forceps or paint brushes or aspirators. Um, <coughs> cave animals can be 
accidentals, things that don't really belong in the cave, um, troglozines, that's a name for animals that use the cave for part of their life cycle and but have to leave the cave for part of their life. That would be things like bats that roost in the cave and go out on the surface, or some little crickets. Troglophiles are animals that, you know, cave lovers that uh, can complete their whole life, they can live for generations in the cave, but you may also find them in cool, moist, shady environments on the surface. Troglobites are really cool, cave adapted, mm -hmm. cave limited, they can only live in the cave. Here's one with really long appendages, no pigment, and they're the most highly cave adapted. Um, and interesting, phreatobites are things that only live in groundwater, and then we often encounter edaphobites, which are animals that live in the soil. There's lots of invertebrates in Illinois caves. Many of them are just accidental, but 40 of them are troglobites or cave limited species. Mostly little shrimp like animals or spiders, millipedes, and then a bunch of springtails and a few insects. Um, there's a number of threatened and endangered species that occur in Illinois caves. This list is a bunch of them. Those with the stars occur in Fogelpole Cave, and the ones with the stars happen to be three out of four of those that have a special little thing after them. That means federally endangered, or in this case, federally threatened. So this is the Illinois Cave Amphipod, Gamma Saccharides. Um, it's federally endangered and lives in Fogelpole. Myotis septentrion alysis is better known as the long-eared bat, um, and it is recently listed as threatened, but I think it's going to be um, endangered and not too long. And then also the Indiana bat. Which is that? Uh, that's Myotis no, sodalis. Oh, that is the Indiana <laughs> bat. Um, so, in preparation for this talk, well, just for our normal keeping track of data, we've been keeping track of all the animals that occur in the cave. And obviously, um, like everyone else working on clifftops, projects. I'm doing this mostly as, a, as, a, as time allows between other projects that have you know, actual funding that pays for graduate students. And this is just the stuff I love. So I got a little, little behind on counting what animals are in there. And it is Illinois' most biodiverse cave, but I've upped the number of creatures in there significantly. Um, and I'm going to go through the counts here briefly. Can you tell, explain what these names are a little and then show you pictures of some representatives. Um, we'll start with the nematomorpha. Those are horsehair worms. They're parasites in beetles and crickets. And sometimes if you have like a horse watering trough or something and you see something that looks like a nematode or just a pale white wispy thing about this long, it's whipping around in the water. That's a horsehair worm. I'll show you a picture of that. Mollusks are things like snails. There's um, five snails known from the cave thus far. Platyhelminthes, we have one flatworm. That's that big white flatworm you already saw a picture of. Um, Anelida is, is true worms like earthworms, but more commonly in, in Fogelpool Cave we have data on some aquatic worms. They like earthworms but live in the water. And then the arthropods is the most uh, species rich group. That's insects and spiders little shrimp-like animals, crayfish, ticks, all that sort of stuff. Um, that's where a lot of the diversity is. The vertebrates, there's 21 vertebrates recorded from the cave now. And then these other three categories are going to click up all together. The 56 fungi that we know of in the cave um, in three different phyla there. And in total, that's 175 species. And that's actually sort of surprised me because there's like 200 species known from caves in Illinois. And some of the ones on this list that I compiled in that last couple of weeks are actually not on that other list. So we have to get all these lists together. And they're always changing because <laughs> go back in the cave, I'll find some more animals. So it's there's a lot going on there. Now a lot of those are not cave limited species. A lot of those are things that just fell in a hole or got washed in in a rainstorm, but sorting out who actually belongs there and who is accidental and who 
can complete their life cycle there. Like there's beetles that are living in there that we would not call cave adapted and don't aren't troglobites or cave limited. But it could be that they're just going through generation after generation for thousands of years there. Well, but they also may live on the surface down by some creeks. So <clears throat> understanding that is something that will last lifetimes trying to figure that all out. This is the horsehair worm, kind of creepy animals. You kind of go into the bathtub and suddenly you rupture and a giant snake came out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if I help you. <laughs> um, this is a, the names of five snails that we know of from the cave. They're terrestrial except for the second one, Ficella, which is this one in the picture. It's all white and Bob Weck sitting in the back of the room has been studying these snails and now he's working with me and a couple of other people and some graduate students and we're trying to determine are these just some sort of weird thing like the only squirrel that's there's a white one that's not it's not cave adapted it's just albino or is this a, a troglobite or something becoming troglobitic and how is it related to the snails found in the surface streams here that are just brown or the common or the the sinkhole ponds the common pond snails that you probably saw as a little kid is closely related to this. So we're trying to sort that out now. And this week I started a graduate student on a project where he's going to take all these snails that a professor working with us from Western Illinois University, he collected all these snails from different caves. And now the graduate student is taking pictures of the shells and will choose landmarks on there and use a uh, software package to look at the shape of the shells and determine you know, are, are all the ones from Fogelpole Cave one shape and the ones from Illinois Caverns another shape? And then we'll do genetic work and say, does that match up and how do these compare to the surface? And I'm pretty excited about that little project. It could easily be an undescribed species and then we have to figure out how to give it a name. I think I've shown this flatworm picture too many times. Same flatworm. It's a vicious predator if you're really small. This leech is probably an accidental or possibly a troglophile in the cave. Um, it's the same individual, just this is zoomed in. Um, they probably came off of turtles that are common in the ponds, sinkhole ponds. Zooming in a little on the arthropods, remember there are 85 of them. There's 10 spiders, ticks, uh, that's what arachnids are. One parapod, which is this weird thing that you've never seen. And uh, two millipedes, two centipedes, and a parapod looks a lot like those two. Um, ten crustaceans, which is little shrimp-like an animals, amphipods, shrimp, crayfish. Um, Twenty-one springtails that I'll talk about more than you think I ought to. Um, three diporans, that was that picture I showed earlier, with the thing with the really long filaments out the back. And then the rest, 36 insects. That's how we get 85 arthropods. So there's a lot of stuff in there. And a lot of it's like we've identified, we know it's it's in this group of organisms. It's different from everything else, therefore it's on my list. I may not have a species level name on it yet. Here's a little pool. You go in the main entrance of Fogel Pole. I don't know if you remember where that water was splashing down from a high in, a, in one of the earlier pictures. Well, down below there's a pool of water and it's got some leaf litter and what do you know? There's all these little spots in there. Those are isopods, a type of crustacean. And if you look really close, there's an earthworm in there too. So look closely at that guy, and it's this. It's Cicadobium rabicata, one of the most common animals in focal pole caves and aquatic habitats. It's a trogophile. It's not cave limited, but the easiest place to find it is in a cave around here. You can find them on the surface, but you might also find some other thing related to it. <coughs> So notice how these little tail end appendages are sort of short um, and the legs are, trust me, they're sort of short. You have to have a relative perspective, I guess, for that. Um, it's got a close relative. This is the same genus, but it's cave adapted. Actually, I've got a picture of another species because I don't have a picture of Mars. But you see these really long appendages? This is a cave limited species, really long legs. It feels out around the environment, tries to avoid that vicious giant white flatworm. Um, so these are cool animals. You don't see them as often, but uh, they occur in the cave. This is just a normal 
pet store type aquarium net and that little shrimp like thing is an amphipod. There's several different kinds of amphipods in the cave. This is the same species, a really nice photo taken by a uh, postdoc working with me, Matt Niemeller. Has no eyes, no pigment to receive light. This is a, a strict subterranean species. It's adapted to living underground in the cave streams. We're actually publishing a paper on this group, this, the genus Bacturus that this is in. We're just publishing a paper that sort of looking at all of the species and what threats there are to the different species across their range. This is another one of the amphipods. This one is uh, perhaps the most common amphipod in caves in Monroe County, and it's very common in the stream and focal pole cave, a little shrimp-like thing about so tall. <coughs> it has eyes, but it doesn't use them most of the time because it's in the cave, but if you go to a, where a spring comes out of the ground and a spring run around here, you'll also find these on the surface. So they're not strict troglobites, but they're mostly cane adapted. This is Gamerus acrodides, and I put this little asterisk here because as I look at the picture, no, that's not, that's a misidentification, but it looks basically just like the other one. So I know there's another amphipod that looks very much like the last one, but it's the Illinois cave amphipod, and it's rare and strictly cave limited. It only occurs in a few cave drainage basins in Monroe County. It used to occur in one up in St. Clair County and nowhere else in the world. And that's part of the reason it's listed as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So this animal has a little bit of regulatory muscle, not much because the Fish and Wildlife Service is politically weak and they don't like to flex their muscle for that reason. But it is, it is something really interesting that this animal just lives here. Um, and there's lots of things to do to study it, to monitor its populations. This crayfish if there's anybody in here who knows common crayfish names, you're probably wondering, what the heck is that? Polychromatus. Never heard of the paint, painted hand mud bug. Well, it turns out there's this widespread common crayfish that occurs in streams here. And this thing is just accidental in the cave. <clears throat> in 2005, somebody looked at these more closely, and the one that occurs here is actually a new species that's different from the one that the original name was anchored to. So this species living here in Monroe County was only described in 2005. It extends a little into Missouri and over into Indiana. And I just learned about it the other day. It's like, what? I sent it off to an expert on these, a picture to confirm my ID and he corrected me. So it's kind of neat that something that was here all along, we didn't understand what it was because nobody had fully studied it. They can be kind of vicious predators, the crayfish. They're, they scavenge around and they'll eat things, but they'll also eat, if they can catch a fish or a little shrimp-like animal, they'll eat them. So when they're in the caves, they can kind of cause some damage to the rest of the cave ecosystem. If you were to collect water dripping down from the ceiling um, in a little bottle with a screen on the side, the water goes out. You keep that water, eventually you get these little tiny planktonic things called copepods. They're just specks, barely visible. If you held them up, a glass of water up with them in there, you might just barely be able to see them. You have to mount them on a microscope slide to ID them. These little animals, um, we know there's copepods in the cave. One, basically I saw copepods in the cave. So we know that group is there. This is two different kinds. We don't know which ones I saw. They may be dripping down from the ceiling, where you might also pick up things like this little aquatic worm. Um, this particular picture is from somewhere else, but I don't have a picture of our two pseudoscorpions. <laughs> pseudoscorpions are like scorpions, but they lack the tail, and they're much, much smaller. Little tiny delicate things that eat springtails and such. One of ours is Moondoctonius cavernicolus, which is known only from false seat salt. Fultz Saltpeter Cave down on the bluff, some of you may know that, and from Fogelpole Cave. And in spite of, I've been going to Fogelpole Cave since the late 1980s, and I've never seen that species in Fogelpole Cave, one of the two places it's known from. They're predators, so they tend to be rare, and they creep along on the sides looking for springtails. I still hope to see one someday. The other uh, pseudoscorpion is just an accidental thing in the cave. 
There's several spiders, two of which are normal part of the cave ecosystem. This is Phanetis subterranean. It's cave adapted, found under little cobble gravels along the side of the stream. You pick them up and there's a little piece of webbing and a little tiny spider living there. And that's this thing. <coughs> the other one is the last of these spiders, Meadow Vallis. It's a big, normal sized creepy spider that hangs out uncomfortably, like about right here when you're in a small passage. <laughs> but they're harmless and just lanky, you know, spidery. <coughs> so as a kid biologist, I'm a little weird. I get excited when I see raccoon poop. Um, for one thing, it means that raccoons are using the caves. And now, not all raccoons use caves, but all caves have raccoons. They're actually an integral part of the cave ecosystems. They come in, they sleep in the caves, and they poop in the caves. And that's an old poop covered in fungus. Um, if you look close, you'll see an earthworm there, probably because of the nutrients, extra nutrients, an older broken down poop. But if you look, there's the earthworm. There's two springtails, so I get my little aspirator with my special oh. filter. <laughs> yeah, I knew that. I suck them off of there. <laughs> That's why they don't allow me to go to parties and stuff. <laughs> but this is that, those little animals in the blue circle. They're actually kind of pretty if you look at them close enough. Little tiny things called springtails. And that's where a lot of the diversity of arthropods is in the caves, and we have some promise of discovering new species in Fogelpole Cave by studying these. Weirdly, I'm not an expert on this group, but um, basically the two experts in the United States happen to have um, their offices in the same town as me, and I'm good friends with them. So we've been collaborating on describing the springtails. This is a really common cave springtail around here. It just looks like a blob, I know. Here's another one, obviously totally different. Um, <laughs> but this one is, is actually cave limited. It's only found in the caves in this area. And this blob is, of course, the most exciting blob. This is a globular springtail. And they tend to be really narrowly endemic. That means they, find, they tend to be found in really small areas, often just one cave. And there's a state listed, I think, uh, one of these, Pygmar hopolites madonensis, known from Madonnaville Cave, and that's a cave in Monroe County, and that's the only place in the world that occurs. Um, and I've seen these in Fogelpole Cave and collected a few, but we've yet to work with the appropriate expert. The guy that's an expert on globular springtails, he's in Brazil, so we have to collaborate with him. But he's a nice guy, and a surfer. <laughs> how, how long is that? That's, um, if you had it on your finger, if you're old like me, you might say, huh, yeah, I think that's one of those. You'd have to take your glasses off to, if you're an old guy, to have the same prescription as me. So they're little specks, like less than a millimeter, to a millimeter and a half. Um, this little thing off the back here, a couple of the earlier ones had it folded underneath. That's the furcula. And they have that and they pop it down on the ground and they go flying into the air like 30 or 60 times their own body weight up into the air. And it's a predator avoidance thing. Um, used to avoid the, the, the pseudoscorpion with the pictures that's out hunting for them. Um, this particular group, the globular ones, the easiest way to find them is find a little drip pool where water's been dripping down onto the ground and it's just a still pool away from the stream. And they hop onto the surface of it and then they're just hanging out on the top of the surface film. Um, so they're actually prettier than this, but they're really hard to get a picture of. <laughs> and it's hard to find people who appreciate them, of course. <laughs> I mentioned the diporans, highly cave adapted, perhaps an edaphobite or soil adapted thing. Um, there's a lot of species we don't know what their names are. They're hard to work on, and there's no active expert in North America. But look at these. Sensory filaments and all the little hairs. Now it's gone. Sorry, you had to look early. <laughs> this is a uh, cave cricket, and there's two kinds of cave crickets. This is Suthophilus elegans, well, two kinds of focal pole cave. This one um, hangs out in the entrance, twilight zone, in the dark zone, but not too far from the entrance, or at least from a cricket entrance, um, because they go out on the surface to forage at night in the summer. And then they'll come back and roost in the caves, and they lay their eggs in the caves. So this is a troglozine, much like a bat. They roost in the cave, and they go out and forage on the surface. Um, so that's kind of neat. The other one, um, which I don't have a picture of, 
Sintafos Williams and I is smaller and it's deep, deep in the cave. And um, though it doesn't show any obvious cave adaptations, pretty much you can't find one unless you go into a cave. And even then, you're kind of lucky to find them because they're rare. Um, it's probably a troglobite, but no one's got the courage to say that in a scientific paper because it's sort of speculation. This is a moth that's found in caves around here really commonly. Scolioptrix labatrix, which is fun to say if you want to show off to people. And uh, it's called, also called the herald moth. And it overwinters in caves. It's got some really distinctive markings. Um, and occurs in Bogan Pole, often in the twilight zone or early dark zone. Um, interestingly, some of these animals that are associated with hanging out near entrances um, I've actually discovered entrances in caves by saying, oh, look, there's crickets here. I thought we're like three hours from the entrance, and you look around, it's like, I think I feel a little air flow. Oh, there's an entrance over there. So you can actually use the animals to indicate where you might have connectivity with the surface, even if a person can't get through. Um, flies, there's several kinds of flies in the cave. This is one of the really common ones that looks superficially like a house fly, but the seagull patterns are all different, and it holds its wings a different way, and the wing wings are different. It's a heliomyzid fly. The family is called the flower flies, but this one is basically only found in caves um, where there are no flowers. This is the larval form or maggot of a fly. Uh, it, we call this larval form the monorail worm, and it makes these webs, and it zips back and forth on them like it's a monorail. And it's a vicious predator of other tiny flies in the cave and springtails that might get tangled in its web. So it's a predatory larva that spins a web. <coughs> if, if you're familiar with the glowworms in New Zealand caves, they make little sparkly blue dots. A few of you might have heard of that. They're the same family as this. And you can see, literally, you can see its intestines inside of there. It'll grow up to be a fungus snap. Um, it looks a little bit like a large mosquito or small crane fly. This is a ground beetle, one of uh, the five species we know of from Fogel Coal Cave so far. And these are most commonly encountered down by the stream, maybe looking for things to feed on their flood debris. <coughs> and here is a little yellow bullhead. This is totally accidental in the cave. You can imagine all these sinkhole ponds mixed in with sinkholes, and when it rains a lot, they might overflow into the adjacent sinkhole. Well, you can just sort of be pouring fish down into the cave by when those ponds overflow. Also, occasionally, the ponds around here, some of you probably have a story on this, and a pond will flush like the toilet. Suddenly, you've got this thing going around, and poof, all the water's gone, and you have a big muddy mess um, because the bottom gave out on the sinkhole, and it all went into the cave. A third way this could get in is from the spring, you could just swim upstream. Except for this one's a little tiny baby, so it probably came from a sinkhole pond somewhere. So it's an accidental in the cave, um, as is this long-eared sunfish, this trophy animal is at least two and a half inches long. <laughs> um, I, I, it's not unusual to see bigger fish in there. They often, the bigger they are, they look kind of pale, and people who don't know better think, oh, maybe they're you know, cave adapted, but what actually happens is that fish actually get tanned. They, they produce more melanin in the presence of sunlight. So some of these common surface fish that get in the cave, they start to lose that melanin, and they're also starving to death because they're visual predators. Um, or at least so we think one of the studies we hope to do is to look at their gut contents and see if they're actually feeding on the cave animals. Um, over in Missouri, there's a guy that's been mapping a cave over there, and they encountered uh, grass carp, big grass carp, and there's a picture of one of the cave mappers holding these five <laughs> carp flapping around. <laughs> Not seen those in, in Pogo Pogo Cave. Um, there's a lot of herps, uh, amphibians and reptiles in caves. This complex of the uh, copes and gray tree frog, they're really hard to tell apart. There's some, I think, hybrids, I'm not sure. Bob probably knows more, but it's different, difficult to tell which is which. This is probably an accidental in caves, unless you're right at the entrance, it may be just seeking shelter where it's cool and moist. This critter, the pickerel frog, though, is a very regular cave inhabitant. They commonly will be hundreds of them in caves in the winter, in, in really big caves like Pogopo. I'm sure there's hundreds in the winter. You may see 5, 10, 20 in any one area. 
usually near an entrance, and they'll hop back out in the spring. But you can pretty much any time you can find one of these in the uh, <coughs> cave. Another similar looking frog, the green frog. Another, this one is an accidental, probably from an adjacent pond. They just did a study of some of the ponds at uh, Paul Whiteman Subterranean Nature Preserve. And interestingly, they did not pick this species up in the surface. They very exhaustive surface studies of some of the sinkhole ponds. But it's common in the Midwest, so it's no surprise to see it there. <coughs> this is the cave salamander, um, which we do see occasionally in Fogelpole Cave. It's definitely very comfortable. It's a troglophile. It's very comfortable living its entire life out there. But if you go out into deep, deep down cutting valleys that are heading out to the Mississippi River floodplain, where there's a lot of limestone and cracked bedrock at night in the summer, you'll find these if you try hard enough. So they're not strictly caved up. But they sure are happy there. And they breed there. You can find the larvae in the water. This is a marbled salamander, which is totally accidental in the cave, but it sure is cute. <laughs> and you don't really run into them that often. Unless you're Bob Whack again, you might see them more than I do. This is, uh, if you know snakes, you would call this a black rat snake, but ours is now officially the gray rat snake. It's the same animal, just new name. <laughs> and in some caves where there's a lot of bats, black rat snakes will go in and they can crawl along and like nook some crannies on and near the ceiling and they'll snag bats off of the ceiling. Um, but this one, remember that picture of me in the kayak? I actually took this picture from the kayak where there was deep water and steep walls and on a ledge was this uh, rat snake. They're in it obviously if it had gone in the cave intentionally, flooding happened and washed it downstream, and now it's here dying on a ledge. So in spite of showing snake pictures in people's fear of dark places and snakes, you don't see snakes in Illinois caves. It just is not a normal place for them, except when this thing is looking for bats near an entrance. <laughs> That's not true in Texas, where I've seen as many as seven or eight rattlesnakes in a single cave entrance. Um, but their caves are really dry. Ours are wet and humid, and snakes don't like that. Here's a garter snake. There's a little pit on the cliff top property of the Paul Whiteman Subterranean Nature Preserve. It goes down about 40 feet, and as part of Aaron's mapping project, we were down there, and I was doing bio inventory at the same time. We found this garter snake down at the bottom, and it's clearly fallen in. And from my perspective, as a person who likes little cave invertebrates, it's feeding the cave with its body. It's sacrificing itself to the cave community. Um, but this is a really common snake in the area. Um, the white-footed mouse is common in the twilight zone and dark zone near entrances. They'll um, put little nests in there, and you see little places where acorns have been chewed open, and that's the, the white-footed mice um, working away. It's hard to get a picture of them. I just got that picture the other day in a different cave. Um, and then later, those acorns start to decay, and they have fungal growth and bacteria on them, and you roll them around with dirty pots like I have, and there's little springtails in there to collect. So it, they bring in nutrients that are part of the cave ecosystem. There's the skull of a possum. Um, it's not unusual to find um, modern skulls and other bones of vertebrates that have fallen into the cave that have no business being there. And that includes the possum. It's not an animal that uses caves at all. So this was just an accidental. It fell in or washed in, and it died there, feeding the cave ecosystem. Where, remember, there's no sunlight, so no photosynthesis. This is a woodchuck skull, um, which is different from a beaver skull, because it has this little spine thing coming out of the eye socket. And it's really dark there because it's right down by the stream, and these rocks are covered with the manganese deposits that Aaron referred to earlier. Sometimes it's a little confusing when you see things that are really black like this. It makes you wonder if they're fossils. So the survey teams that are going in and doing the mapping, one of the things they're supposed to do is photo document when they find bones. And it's actually not, I don't decide <coughs> what those are. I, I, I make sure the paleontologist looks at them because, of course, Things like this also existed in the Pleistocene and before all sorts of mammals were in the landscape. So 
but this one turns out to be just a recent woodchuck, and <laughs> they do use cave entrances and sinkholes. They'll have little burrows down in there. When I walk along, that's my boot there, and I see this stuff on the floor. That's bat poops. And so that means there's a, a roost, a significant roost of bats. And I always look up above, and here this is a ceiling channel, and there's some staining where the bats were roosting. So the bats are hanging out on the ceiling, and they, they hang out in the same spot. They come back every year to that spot. Maybe different bats that actually move between caves. And when they urinate and take off, often when they just take off, they'll pee just as they take off, and that will help that staining develop there. One of my earliest experiences with a colony of bats was there was a big round colony like this. I was in Arizona in a, in a cave, and I went and looked at it really close. I was like, wow, look at those bats, and they all took off and just peed all over. <laughs> <laughs> this is an uh, Indiana bat, and it looks like I forgot to turn off some other uh, stuff in the background. But, um, this one has a tear in their wing. They're fine with having a tear in their wing. Um, this is from another cave, but there are Indiana bats. We've seen them in Overpole Cave. Here, this is a little brown bat. It's infected with this fungus, Pseudogymnoascus destructans, which is the causative agent of white nose syndrome. And you can see how it gets that. So the special gloves are because we're doing a study of these diseased bats in Illinois, and including Fogelpol Cave and part of that study. This is another of our bats, the northern long-eared bat. This is the one that just got listing as uh, federally threatened. Um, I think it'll be federally endangered soon because it's probably the most sensitive bat in Illinois when it comes to dying from white nose syndrome. They just, they're just dropping like flies. It's really tragic. And you can see this one has some little fungal colonies on its nose. And bats are kind of tough to ID. They all look like little brown fur balls. This one, this little piece sticking up there, I don't know if you can see that, but that's the tragus is part of the ear and it's really long in this species. And this is another one of our bats, the tricolored bat, or pipistrel. And this one is covered with water droplets. It's just sleeping. It's perfectly healthy. And it'll wake up and maybe lap some of the water off its fur and then go back to sleep for the rest of the winter. Also, note all these natural different kinds of colors of fungal colonies on the rock there. And this is the biggest of the bats that lives in Vogelpohl Cave, the big brown bat. They sometimes like it really cold, so different bats will choose different uh, environmental conditions where the temperature is just right or it's the right humidity. These guys like it cold, and I've seen them in the winter wedged into little cracks just right near an entrance where it's just freezing cold, but they're, they're perfectly happy with that. And they are not very susceptible at all to the white nose syndrome, so they're doing just fine um, relative to some of the other bats. <coughs> I was surprised to come up with two birds. I was expecting this one, the eastern Phoebe. They nest in cave entrances, and there's been a nest in the entrance of Fogelpole Cave, the main entrance on the state of land, just inside the entrance gate. And there's this nest, and every summer, there's the eastern Phoebes, and they have a little uh, fledglings will come out. And actually, this last year, we went in one day and set some monitoring stations up, <coughs> and there were the little nestlings. I remember I took a picture of as we walked by it. And we came out, and then the, two days later, we went back to pick up our monitoring stuff. And as we came into the cave, the little nestlings all fledged and flew out of the cave. It was kind of neat. But the second um, vertebrate, or second bird we got, which if there was a cave biologist in the audience, they would be thinking, oh yeah, a turkey vulture. Well, no, we haven't found a turkey vulture, which they do nest in caves. But the second one was actually the cowbird. One year we found a cowbird egg. It's a, they're a nest parasite of other birds. So that's our second bird for the cave this far. Probably someday we'll find a place where there's an entrance that has a turkey vulture nesting. And that's really fun because they'll defend their nest spot by throwing up at you. <laughs> and they don't eat like really fancy foods. <laughs> So this isn't about that lovely heliomyzid fly, it's about all this gooey stuff around there. And I'm going to talk just briefly about fungi and bacteria, which I don't really know that much about. So the fungi we're talking about are not the big fruiting bodies that you might see. It. Like, it's not morels and poisonous amanitas, but little tiny things that you 
discover by growing them on uh, auger petri dishes in the laboratory. So we use sterile swabs. This is actually part of a larger study of the bat white nose syndrome. We were looking at what kind of fungi live in the cave, and that's why we have a list of fungi because we we're able to swab the walls and the bats and collect up a list. And I asked the mycologist, the fungal specialist, to send me a list of what we detected in Pole Pole Cave. And there's this list. Um, yeah. As soon as you're done reading it, it will go on. <laughs> And there is Pseudogymnoascus destructans, the one that causes the bat white nose syndrome. Mm -hmm. And those that are in the very front row can see Geomyces panorum right above it. That's an extremely closely related species that just nat naturally occurs in the soil of caves. Um, in the same study, there was a guy that does bacterial work using um, basically whole community sequencing. He takes these samples and he just makes these long lists of all of the possible different kinds of bacteria that occur in the cave. So I have these different colors are different phyla of bacteria. So I assume that relative sizes of those have to do with um, how many different unique kinds of bacteria in these different phyla of bacteria there are. But I don't know what this total is, so I don't know how many species of bacteria that he detected in the cave. But their life also and they're an important part. The fungi and bacteria, they break down that woody debris. These are things those little springtails feed on, <laughs> and the pseudoscorpions feed on the springtails, and the spiders feed on the pseudoscorpions, and the salamanders feed on the spiders. So it's all a little ecosystem there. And with that, I'm at a spot, if you're restless, tired, um, or I can go on, or I'll look at Carl, and Carl, do you want me to stop? Or... <laughs> he says I should stop. All right. <laughs> so I'm happy to answer some questions. I have a question for you. This is indirectly. This happened right close to Fort Polk's Cave one night years ago when I, when I was in the farm. My dad and I were walking across this field going home. It was dark, and we noticed something on the ground. We landed, and we turned the lantern off, and the entire field, this is about oh, six, seven acres, the entire field was covered with bowlers. Huh. Yeah. The only time in the years and years that we had that form, the only time we ever felt it. So those are probably uh, the larval form of or the immature of fireflies, which are a type of bees. They're about, you know, maybe, maybe three quarters of an inch long. Yeah. Long. yeah, and a little fluorescent glow. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's what they were. Uh, for years, I've been trying to figure well, out what I was thinking. Yeah. Do you have to be cautious when you're on them all the bacteria or anything, like for, for human contact or anything? Are you worried about what you might catch or something? Or? Well, the cave stream is the most worrisome part. I mean, the walls of the cave, those are just natural things yeah. that live in the cave, and they're just like walking through the woods. I mean, if you go out in the woods and you're digging in the dirt, you might wash your hands before you eat yeah. dinner, but not everybody does. You know? yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> mostly people are more or less fine. But the cave stream is transporting when septic tanks don't get properly inspected and they rupture and they start leaking out, mm -hmm. or a farmer has a whole bunch of cattle and he lets them forage all the way down into the bottom of the sinkhole and it rains. And all of those fecal coliforms and other bacteria get into the cave stream, and you can get a really serious infection if you have an open wound from those. So, if I'm eating in the cave and I'll try to find it, I usually bring some little wipes with me, sterile wipes, and kind of clean my hands off. I'm trying to be a little bit careful, but it's not, it's, I mean, it's like going in a surface stream here, but most people don't know how bad they are. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks a lot. If anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, you're welcome.